morning, church family. My name is Lisa Larson, and I want to briefly talk with you about that uncomfortable topic, giving. First off, I want to thank all of you for your continued support of our church during this challenging time when we aren't able to gather and life can feel uncertain on a daily basis. I want to encourage you, though. God is with us, and God will provide. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 8:28 that God works all things together for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. What a great reminder for the times that we are living in. We may be physically distanced, but as a church, we continue to worship, pray, connect, have online study groups, gather for Kingdom Kids and confirmation, and even help our neighbors in need through outreach ministries. Wow! You all heard Pastor Nancy is dyeing her hair purple because we raised over a thousand food items for Cross, right? That is amazing! Jesus is working in and through our lives even amidst the uncertainty, but should we be surprised by that? Not being able to gather as a church during Lent and Easter has been difficult, not only as a church, but financially. It's easy to think that church expenses could be down since we aren't gathering in person, but there are operational costs that continue. Our wonderful staff continue working to provide all new ways to stay connected in worship, ministry, and outreach. We are truly thankful for our staff. None of the online services, Bible studies, children's ministry, or outreach would be possible without them. I want to let you know about the many ways that you can give. Giving can be done online at mglc.org or through the Give Plus app, or you can text to give. I encourage you to reach out to our finance team at finance at mglc.org. Remember, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Have a blessed day. Good morning, friends in Christ. Please join me in the Easter greeting as we begin our worship today. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia! of Jesus Christ, you have brought us out to a spacious place where we are called to live as those redeemed. Empower us by your Spirit to keep your commandments, that we may show forth your love with gentle word and reverent deed to all your people. Amen.
Hi kids, it's Shelly, and I'm here to talk to you today about a fruit. Um, let me see if you can guess this fruit. It's yellow, and you peel it to eat it. <laughs> no, it's not a banana. Um, I'll give you some more hints. You find it in trees, and you peel it like an orange. Have you guessed it? That's right, it's a lemon, a lemon. Now, lemons are an interesting fruit because they're not uh, something we just peel and eat, really, most of us. But a lemon is something that we can use to squeeze on our fish in, when we're eating fish for dinner, or we can um, garnish a drink and put lemons like in fresh ice water. That's delicious and refreshing. And lemons are also good if you squeeze the juice out of it into a cup, add some sugar, and voila, you have lemonade. And lemonade is so refreshing and so good and sweet, especially in the summertime, don't you think? Well, I would have liked to have seen the man that, or woman, that took the first bite of a lemon, peeled it, saw how juicy it was, took a bite of it, and I bet, I bet they went, ooh, and shivered for a few seconds. It's pretty bitter, pretty sour, and it just makes you pucker up. Probably something that you wouldn't want to eat every day for a snack, that's for sure. But if you doctor it up with sugar, then you have your lemonade. You know, sometimes life is like a lemon. And people say there's a saying that says, give me, if life gives you a lemon, make lemonade. Mm. But what does that mean? Hmm. If life gives you a lemon, maybe, maybe something in your life is kind of bitter and sour and dark and gloomy and not fun and you're crabby and everything else. Well, you know what? You can take all that gloom and that bitterness and you can turn it into bright sunshine and sweetness. God does that for us. All we have to do is depend on him, have faith in him, and he will take our lemons, our darkness, our gloominess, and turn it into lemonade. Um, there, there's so many stories in the Bible that we read where people are in trouble and maybe in prison or in a desert, alone, um, have many losses in their life and they're just so down. But God can turn that around. He can turn all that gloominess and make it into something bright and wonderful. All we have to do is call out to him and follow him, and he'll take care of that for us. So we need to, at the end of the gloom and the bitterness and the darkness in our life, we need to just make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, making sure that everybody hears what we have to say, how God turned our gloominess and our bitterness into something bright and refreshing. Let's pray. Okay, like I always say, fold your hands, close your eyes, and bow your head. Precious Lord, thank you for lemons, and thank you for lemonade, and thank you that we can shout out to you, Lord, in a joyful noise to all the earth. Be with these children and their family this week and keep them safe and well. We pray this in your name. And all God's children said, Amen. Psalm 66. Be joyful in God, all you lands. Be joyful, all the earth. Sing the glory of God's name. Sing the glory of God's praise. Bless our God, you peoples. Let the sound of praise be heard. Our God has kept us among the living and has not allowed our feet to slip. For you, O God, have tested us. 
You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid heavy burdens upon our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water. But you brought us out into a place of refreshment. I will enter your house with burnt offerings and will pay you my vows, those that I promised with my lips and spoke with my mouth when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt offerings of fatlings with the smoke of rams. I will give you oxen and goats. Come and listen, all who believe, and I will tell you what God has done for me. I called out to God with my mouth and praised the Lord with my tongue. If I had cherished evil in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But in truth, God has heard me and has attended to the sound of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not rejected my prayer, nor withheld unfailing love from me. A reading, a reading from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own prophets has, have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. May mercy, grace, and peace be yours in abundance through God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, our preaching series through the New Testament book, Acts of the Apostles, brings us to a storied hill in the ancient city of Athens. Athens, the cradle of democracy, where philosophers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle expanded realms of human knowledge and reason. The ruins of the Parthenon, symbol of that golden age, still dominate the city's skyline. On the hillside below, a rocky outcrop known as the Areopagus, named after the Greek god of war, Ares, stands. A legendary jury of God, what gods was said to have put Ares on trial right there for murdering the son, of the, sea god, the son of the sea god Poseidon. The Areopagus came to refer to both the court and the place where it tried 
cases of murder, injurious attacks, but also cases of religious matters were heard there. Socrates made his defense there, having been charged with making public claims against the state religion. 500 years later, the city still loved its religion. When Paul arrived in Athens, he found a veritable forest of marbled gods. Luke, the writer of Acts, jabbed at the Athenians, saying they spend all their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest philosophical abstractions. This was Paul's second missionary trip. In his first trip, Paul traveled between Jewish communities, stopping at each synagogue to find a place to stay and rest, and an invitation to the synagogue where Paul would use Hebrew scripture to prove to his audience Jesus was the Messiah. His second tour brought him into Greece, and it had started out badly. There was an uproar in Thessalonica, forcing him to escape to Berea with his opponents hot on his trail. Paul's companions thought it best for him to keep going. So here he was in Athens. Acts 17 verse 8 tells us Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection in the marketplace when a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some scoffed, but others, more curious, brought him to the Areopagus. May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, they asked. So, Paul stood on the rocky outcrop named after the son of Zeus, to tell the court about the son of the one true God. With all his skills of rhetoric, Paul built a bridge for them to cross. And his speech sets an example for later generations on how to share the gospel to other cultures. The inspiration for Paul's speech came from a shrine that he'd seen during his walking tour through Athens titled, To an Unknown God. Despite the Athenians' expansive worship of deities, apparently there was a feeling that they had missed something. Perhaps this shrine was the most spiritual of all the shrines, acknowledging that human longing to know the divine. Paul takes up that thought. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. A more modern philosopher, Blaise Pascal, explained it this way. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man, which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. When we don't know God, almost any created thing tries to fill the place in our hearts meant for God. We might not build a shrine or offer burnt sacrifice, but our attachments, infatuations, how we invest our time, our money, our emotions reveal our idols. When we don't know God or drift away or uh, term in, in popular usage today, when we ghost God and just drop him, anything can happen. You can be sure though that whatever you try to substitute won't love you or care for you, or resurrect you, as God will. Beloved in the Lord, I want you to listen up right now. For your sake, and for those you love, 
This coronavirus has made us all vulnerable. A few months ago, we felt we were in control and independent, and we tended to say to life's challenges, I can handle that. But our life is not the same now. I read an article on the crazy dreams people are having as our subconscious minds try to get a grip on all the unknowns we are facing. I've had a few of those dreams. Have you? The truth is that even for those who have escaped infection so far, this virus has taken away part of our lives. Maybe for you it's a job loss or new worries for loved ones, or a loss of income. Certainly our sense of security is diminished, our freedom of movement, our ability to be together. These uncomfortable realities push and pull at you, and people are acting on them in all kinds of ways, trying to cope. Some of those ways make the news. But others are hidden, like turning to drugs, or family violence, or seeking solace in something that is false and even a danger to you. In the midst of daily struggles, remember, you are the Lord's flock. He loves you and knows you by name. More than ever, turn to the one who made you. Instead of, I can handle it, humbly acknowledge before him, I can't handle it alone, but I can with you. This is a confession of faith that brings us back to the God we know, who has our future in his hands. His resurrecting power given to us in Jesus Christ will get us through this one day at a time. March 8th was the last time that Jim and I hiked the North Shore before the whole world shut down. We lucked out weather-wise. It was warm and entirely pleasant. Even the snow was warm. Wow, did I feel the power of God bringing the earth back to life. Even though the signs were subtle, like water flowing under the ice, moss peeking through bare patches, ducks returning. But the most striking change was the light. The higher angle of the sun brightened the whole landscape, even the valleys. It was the light that assured me spring was on its way. But here's one more amazing thing, something that's not bound by the seasons. The gift of waking up each morning to God's grace once more. A new start. The privilege that God is in our hearts and hands using them. Having the resurrecting power of Jesus in our lives, making all things new. Paul knew Jesus' resurrecting power. You know, there's great irony about him preaching from the Areopagus, the place for murder trials. Paul, who was the Hebrew Saul, had persecuted Christians. He had them thrown into prison and beaten. He stood approvingly as the mob stoned Stephen. Paul knew he could have been charged before the throne of God for murder. But on the road to Damascus, he met the risen Christ and his mercy. Paul preached from the Areopagus about the God made known on a hill far away on a cross where God's Son took all the judgment for all of us. He did not plead for mercy. 
His atoning death was God's mercy given. Paul knew the resurrecting power of Jesus for him. A parishioner who toured Greece and climbed up to the Areopagus told me it was an awesome feeling standing where Paul gave that sermon. I want you to imagine now that you're there with the opportunity to share the story of Jesus. What would you say? Paul's message came down to this. God sent his son Jesus to live for us, to die for us, and rise again. It's like that gospel hymn goes, if you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot preach like Paul, oh, you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say he died for all. You don't need rhetorical flourishes like an orator. In fact, the most effective way is to tell what that means to you. Personally, tell your story. Among the judges listening to Paul that day was one Dionysus the Areopagite. Years before, he had studied in Heliopolis in Egypt at the time of Christ's crucifixion in Jerusalem. When he heard the account of Good Friday, that from noon to three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land, Dionysus exclaimed, God himself suffers. And faith took root in him. Later in Athens, Paul's sermon served to confirm his faith. He and his family were baptized in 52 AD, and Dionysus became the first bishop of Athens. You never know how the Lord will use your story of faith. Like the Athenians with their statue to the unknown God, people today have a God-shaped hole in their hearts. And it's a dangerous time. They're looking for what can fill that hole. So tell your story, how you came to know God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes.
to us in the form of your Son, Jesus Christ. Embolden your church as your followers to reveal your love to everyone in our speaking and in our living. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are the creator of heaven and earth. Revitalize the health of the oceans, rivers, lakes, springs, glaciers, and bodies of water in our community that give life, especially Elm Creek and Rush Creek creek and our lakes, rice, weaver, fish, eagle, pike, edward, cedar island and mud lake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call all the people of the world your children. Judge the nations justly, show mercy to the oppressed, and speak truth to power through your prophets. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You come near to us when we are lost, and you hear our distress. We pray for those who suffer in any way and ask your healing, strength, and hope. For Elizabeth Crow, Pastor Chris's niece Anna Fawcett, Tom Fierkenstead, Tom Moravik, Jessica Mayer, Laura Russell. We also lift up those who have been affected by COVID-19. Mary Bruchwein's niece and nephews, Mary, John, and Luke, who are healthcare professionals working with COVID-19 patients. Jenny Mulner's friend, Brian Hansen, and his wife, Deb. Gretchen Zygmunt's friend, Melody Schreiner, a nurse hospitalized with COVID-19. Pastor Chris's cousin, Aaron, and his wife, Vanessa, a nurse, both recovering from the virus. And those whom we name before you, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your commandments are good and merciful. Give us courage to take hold of our baptismal promises, to work for justice, advocate for the voiceless, and free the oppressed and imprisoned in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You remain with us always, O God, and your kingdom has no end. We remember the saints who have gone before us, we ask your gracious care and comfort for the family of our sister in Christ, Carol Buford. Unite us forever in your final victory over death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care through Christ our Lord, amen. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. God.